Cyclic molecules are all over the place in organic chemistry, and chances are you'll see the cyclic ether cleavage reaction on your next test. So let's go over a few examples to make sure you're all prepared to tackle anything that comes your way. But first, let's do a real quick uh, review of how the ether cleavage works. Ethers are molecules where we have two alkyl groups, which may or may not be the same, connected through an oxygen atom. And when we are talking about ether cleavage, we are talking about a reaction that breaks our ether. And typically we are going to perform that cleavage in the presence of hydrogen halide, where our X is going to be either chlorine, bromine or iodine. HF is almost never used there, because HF is not actually a very strong acid, so it's not good enough to protonate our oxygen and go with the reaction. And as a general rule of thumb, we are going to end up with two halides of some sort, two alkyl halides. Mechanistically speaking, this reaction can be either SN1 or SN2, depending on the nature of your alkyl group. Secondary or tertiary alkyl groups, they tend to do the reaction via the SN1 mechanism, while the primary alkyls are going to prefer the uh, SN2 mechanism because they cannot form the carbocation, and because of that they need to come up with a different way to accomplish this mechanism. Now, that would be the idea for the regular ethers. Now, what if we have a cyclic ether where all our groups are actually interconnected? Well, that means that in the final product, instead of two alkyl halides, we are going to end up with a single molecule, unless, of course, we are cutting our molecule in multiple places. Mechanism-wise, though, there are going to be no difference. So now, with this in mind, let's look at a few examples. And my first example here is fairly straightforward. I have a five-membered ring with an oxygen, tetrahydrofurane, and I'm reacting that with HBr. Step number one in this reaction is going to be the protonation of our oxygen, so we're going to be using our tetrahydrofurane here as a base, and HBr is obviously going to be an acid. And as a result of this proton transfer, we are going to get our protonated intermediate. The important thing here to notice is that both sides are our primary alkyls. To the left we have a primary alkyl, and to the right we have a primary alkyl as well. And I'll remind you real quick here that we're determining the nature of our alkyl by looking how many other carbons we have attached to our carbon of interest. So if, let's say, I look at this carbon over here, that guy is only attached to one other carbon. And because of that, that is going to be a primary alkyl. And because it is a primary alkyl, that means that we are going to have to do the SN2 mechanism. And the way the SN2 mechanism is going to work, we are going to have our Br-, which is going to play a role of our nucleophile, and that going to come in and attack our electrophilic carbon opening up our ring. As a result of this nucleophilic attack, I broke the bond between this carbon and this oxygen, so now this carbon and the oxygen are no longer connected to each other. However, the bond that I used to have between oxygen and the other carbon, well, that bond is still here. Nothing happened to that bond. I didn't break that one yet. This intermediate that I have made here, however, is not going to be our final product. The thing is, these reactions are typically done in excess of HX, so we are going to have the second equivalent of our HBr reacting with our molecule, doing the proton transfer like in the previous step, so I am going to have my oxygen protonated by the HBr molecule, making this H2O, which is going to serve as a leaving group. Now, again, since this is still a primary position, that means that we're still going to have the SN2 mechanism, so the Br-, that is going to be our nucleophile, going to come in and displace our leaving group in one step without the formation of any carbocations, giving us the final product that's going to look like this. Or if I wanted to zigzag our molecule in the usual way, how we normally draw our molecules, that's going to look something like that. So I have my carbons 1, 2, 3, 4. These carbons are 1, 2, 3, 4 right over here. So as a shortcut here, you can remember that whenever you have a cyclic ether, we are going to break our molecule at the place where the oxygen is, 
and then each carbon that was connected to our oxygen, that carbon is now going to be attached to the X in our final product, giving me a molecule looking like this. And of course, the co-product in this reaction is going to be a water molecule, but we don't really care about that, so most of the time you are not even going to be writing that out. Now, in my next example, I have something a little bit more interesting. I have one cycle and I have the other cycle. In this case, however, I only have oxygen in one one cycle in the smaller cycle, so that is going to be the only cycle that I'm going to be breaking here. And the other one, my six-membered ring, well, that one is going to stay intact. And like in the previous case, my first step is going to be to protonate my oxygen, so I'm going to take the electrons of my oxygen and I'm going to move that electron density towards the hydrogen of my HI, giving me the following protonated intermediate. Now, here, unlike in the previous case, we have a secondary alkyl group and we have a tertiary alkyl group. So both of those going to push us towards the SN1 style mechanism. And if you were to choose where to start your reaction, choose the tertiary position over the secondary position for your initial carbocation formation. Which means that in this case, the bond that I'm going to be breaking is right here that's going to give me a tertiary carbocation because I'm breaking a bond between oxygen and my tertiary atom. Remember that in this case, we are not going to be doing the direct attack by our nucleophile, so we need to make the carbocation first, and then our nucleophile is going to be attacking the resulting carbocation. Now, from the mechanistic standpoint, from the mechanistic classification, we are going to be classifying this reaction as the leaving group dissociation. And while normally we are used to seeing leaving group just completely departing our molecule, in this case we can say that this whole part of the molecule is our leaving group over here. So while that leaving group opens up the molecule and still stays as a part of the molecule, it is still a living group from the mechanistic classification standpoint. And so now when we have our carbocation, the next step is going to be taking our nucleophile, which is going to be an iodide anion in this case, and reacting that with our carbocation, giving us the alkyl halide as the product of this particular step, looking like this. Now, just like in the previous case, we are not going to stop at this point and we are going to continue our reaction because we still have the OH group over here and we have excess of our HI so we can continue. Meaning that I will first take my OH and protonate it with HI, making H2O plus that's going to be my living group. That living group is going to dissociate, giving me corresponding carbocation. That is a secondary carbocation. And I want to stop you right here because as soon as you form a secondary carbocation, we always want to double check for any possible carbocation rearrangements. Tertiary carbocations, while they can potentially rearrange, the chances of that are pretty slim. Uh, the only way the tertiary carbocation going to rearrange is if, let's say, we have an allylic position or a benzylic position nearby, so the chances of that are low. The secondary carbocations, however, they have a much higher chance of rearrangement, especially if we are sitting next to a tertiary position like what we have over here in this case. So as soon as you see a secondary carbocation, that must be an immediate red flag that you gotta check for carbocation rearrangements. Here we have the hydrogen which we can move around in the hydride shift like that, giving you a new, more stable tertiary carbocation. There is actually a possibility of yet another rearrangement from this point, but let's not overcomplicate things too much and just stop here. So now, when we have our newly formed more stable carbocation, we can do the nucleophilic attack from our I- attacking this position, giving you a final product that looks like this. So here, if we were to use our shortcut and just break our molecule uh, at the position where the oxygen is and just slap our iodine to the carbons that are attached to our oxygen, we would actually get the incorrect product. So while shortcuts are a cool thing to have, I always recommend you going through the mechanism, at least quickly run through the mechanism in your head just 
to make sure that you are not going to be missing any kind of rearrangements of this sort, because something like that is definitely a fair game for the test when your instructor will try to catch you on the carbocation rearrangement in the place where you expected the least. And in this place in the course, you are definitely going to be responsible for any kind of carbocation rearrangements, because chances are you have already covered those before in the first semester, so there is no excuse for you not noticing this one here. Okay, moving on, my next example here is again a bicyclic system, and again the only cycle that I am actually going to be breaking is this one with an oxygen. So just like before, my first step here is going to be protonation of my oxygen, so I'm going to do that right away, giving me the following protonated intermediate. Now, there are a couple of important things that I want to point out here. First of all, let's look at our alkyl groups and decide what type of alkyl groups we have. On the right side we have a primary alkyl group, and on the left side we have a secondary alkyl group. But there is one extremely important thing that you need to see here, and that is the fact that our secondary alkyl group that I have on the left is not just secondary, but that is also an sp2 hybridized atom. That is extremely important, because when when you have a potentially living group on an sp2 hybridized atom, you can neither do the SN1 reaction, because the formation of the carbocation on the sp2 hybridized atom is extremely unfavorable, nor can you do the SN2 style reaction, because in this case the attack would have to originate right from the middle of your aromatic ring, and that's a little bit of a science fiction, because there is absolutely no way you can jam something right in there and do your reaction. Which means that this bond that we have between this carbon, the secondary carbon and oxygen, that bond is untouchable. We are not going to be able to cleave that ether from that direction, no matter what we do. So the only thing that we can do in this case is take our nucleophile, which is going to be iodide, and attack our primary carbon right over here, giving me the final product looking like this. So notice that I did not touch my OH on the aromatic ring. We are going to keep it right where it is and we are not going to do anything with it. Because as I've mentioned a moment ago, it is impossible to do any kind of substitution in this position via a simple SN2 or SN1 mechanism, so there is no way we'll be able to replace that. This is a fairly common trick that instructors give on the exam, so be on the lookout for something like that. And talking of tricks, here is a biphenyl ether and this one is probably the biggest trick of all of them. The thing is, here my oxygen is connected to a secondary carbon on the left and the secondary carbon on the right, and both of those carbons, they are both sp2 hybridized, both of them, which means that I cannot cleave either of my bonds, which means that in this case we are going to see no reaction. I know this is kind of a mean trick, but I have seen those before in the test, so be on the lookout for something like that, because some instructors think that this is a very amusing example, so they will show it on the exam just because. Now, my next example here looks a little bit different. Normally, when we see ether cleavage, we typically see reactions with something like HX, but in this case we have one water in the presence of the sulfuric acid. So what are we going to do in this case? Well, actually, in this case, we have a pretty much same reaction again. Here, the first thing that's going to happen, my H2O is going to react with sulfuric acid, which I'm going to show like this, so water is going to get protonated by my sulfuric acid like so, giving me H3O+, which, in fact, is pretty much the same as treating that as HX, where my X is H2O. So I'm going to have exactly the same reaction, the only difference here is going to be, instead of my X-, minus, I'm going to have H2O as my nucleophile. So my step number one, one is going to be protonating my oxygen of my cyclic ether, giving me the following intermediate, and in this case I have a primary alkyl and another primary alkyl making my ether, which means that I am again going to be looking at the SN2 style reaction. And as I've mentioned a moment ago, my X- minus here is going to be my H2O, so I'm going to draw the H2O and I'm going to use that as my nucleophile. So I'm going to say that water comes in 
and opens up my ether like so, giving me the following intermediate and I need to make sure that this intermediate is neutral, so I'll have to get rid of the extra proton that I have sitting on my H2O now. In order to do so, what I'm going to do here, I will redraw my molecule actually showing the bonds like this, so now I can show that another equivalent of my water, so another H2O, or potentially uh, my conjugate base from my sulfuric acid, HSO4- can come in and deprotonate my intermediate, giving me the final product looking like this, or if I wanted to zigzag our atoms like we normally do, that's going to look like so. And just to make sure that I didn't miss any carbons, I have my carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and those are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in my zigzag product, so I didn't miss anything. And for my last example here, I have another cyclic ether, but now I have two oxygens in the same cycle, so I am going to end up cutting this molecule in two places. The alkyl groups connected to my oxygen are all primary, so I have primary here, primary here, and primary there, which means that the entire mechanism is going to be via the SN2 steps. And as a challenge, I challenge you to write the entire mechanism here and show how we are going to get the products in this case. Talking of which, my final products here is going to be two equivalents of the same alkyl halide, so I could have just written it once and say that we have two equivalents of that, and of course we're also going to make two equivalents of water, which is our side product or co-product if you like. And the entire mechanism here should be eight steps together. And now you should be able to deal with any kind of ether cleavage on the exam. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, you can tell me that by hitting the like button and leaving me the comment below. Your likes and comments really help in promoting my videos and help more students see them. Subscribe to the channel for more organic chemistry updates and tutorials, watch this video next, and I will see you next time!